The muse is a harsh mistress. The muse is a harsh mistress who never heeds commands. I shout when at my great distress to shape a line, I make demands on her, then vivaciousness turns wanton, and she damns my insolence. Yet worthiness to her means patience, grand endurance, even waywardness with truth. She understands nothing of time's wretchedness or the failure of empty hands. Yet only can I listen and my muse adore and lay my lines and meter at her door. I'm so happy to be here today. Uh, I am uh, relaunching a book that I wrote uh, some years back, Depth of Field, which I'm very proud to say is carried by this bookstore. And I have other copies that uh, I will love, be happy to sign. I'm going to read a few poems uh, out of that book and uh, some new poems because I've been, I've been sort of reviving my poetry career after a hiatus of some years. Um, and I'm going to read a poem that uh, was also reprinted in an anthology I'm really proud of called Best Texas Writing Two. Thank God they didn't put a year on it because it was a few years ago. Uh, but uh, I have, uh, I got a couple of emails and messages and one good friend of mine and his wife, uh, who's also a friend of mine, said they couldn't be here because they were uh, uh, at, a, at a folk festival. Or what, what's this weekend? Is it Kerrville? Kerrville. Kerrville. And uh, I was at the Kerrville Folk Festival uh, some years back and in a large old fashioned canvas tent and I was reading the autobiography of Ulysses Grant, which is a, a, a minor classic of American literature that Mark Twain really liked, and realized that my life and my country, uh, my country's history, both had a, an unusual intersection at Vicksburg, Mississippi. And this poem is called Grant Behind Vicksburg. It's on page 23 of my book. I heard the story over and over again in my childhood about how I had been tongue-tied, late to speak, grandson of deaf mutes, and when the time came, I found one word, employing it promiscuously, dog. I said it for everything my mother told me those years later on hot summer days when all her children would gather under the oscillating fan's refuge in her large bed, lying and talking together. As she said the stories of our forgotten pasts, one day the story went, I looked up in surprise and said, quite clearly, that's a bridge. It was at Vicksburg crossing the father of waters, I spoke. Vicksburg was the knot. High on bluffs commanding the Mississippi, it restricted that river from full use by the United States Navy from occupied New Orleans all the way north, a water sword to slice off Texas and Arkansas and Louisiana from the Confederacy. Grant tried for months to get behind Vicksburg. Breaking levees and digging canals, moving ironclads into tortuous tree-shouted creeks, pushing and searching for a way behind the blue men labored and sometimes died. I will lay siege too when I get there, cutting tangled lingual thickets until free-flowing language bursts all the seams of rebellion. And Grant turned east after running the batteries. Enemies entrenched on the great river, both north and south, living off the land, moving purposefully to get behind Vicksburg. I am ready at last for marching, living off the language of my youth, resolute to seize some tongue that's a bridge. On page 27, I have a poem that I wrote 
I want to set the stage, if you can imagine a great famous poet who's very old, who got early fame, and everybody knew his poems, but he wrote in his 20s, love poems, and he's over 70 now. And they're still asking him to read his poem. The great poet reads. The great poet lets himself be prevailed upon again to read his audience's favorite poem from his youth, a young man writing his last lines to his fragile lover. Their moving lips keep time with his old husky voice, words they learned from anthologies and school books recited with their own litanies of losses and longings. The great poet reads and drops beneath all speech to the dry and tortuous ridgeline of an ancient scar, a range once immersed by antediluvian salty floods that tossed the arc of his career into famous voyages, scudding across seas, colliding with angry continents into the mouths of the adoring cataracts of their need. The great poet says, it is the last poem, the last time he will ever speak of her. Again, he sings the syllables of her elegant young throat into the strange auditorium. He has written incantations to solidarity, green ballads and ominous dream dramas, elegies and invocations, but this is the poem they must hear before they leave. The great poet has transmuted her flesh into the ivory of the blankest page of any sea wanderer's journal, has transfused her blood into dark and permanent ink, has convinced the silent masses that he must yet recall her long and slender fingers, has marshaled his images on this dry and distant acropolis of the last poem to her. I uh, would really like to write a love poem now, but I'm having a hard time writing a love poem to my daughter. I love her very much. It's a real challenge, and I'm, I'm hoping that I, that I pull that off. But I did write this poem some years back, and it was actually addressed to my daughter. It was a different situation. It was about a student who had been, who had told the truth and been forced to recant the truth by a very evil teacher, which led to a lot of uh, changes in my life, actually. It led me to go to a better school. Um, but I wrote this to my daughter with images of my daughter, and it's dedicated for, to my daughter. Ethics at bedtime, it's on page 21. When you rest your lovely head in dreams of ponies, butterflies, and princess towers, remember there are witches with the power to twist and gnarl your aims until you seem to lose your truth in daunting, haunting streams of lies and gaudy, rustling, evil, evil flowers that devil dance, suborning you to cower negative, entranced, chrysalis in screams. Should you make yourself truth's butterfly and find the wings that bear you safe from harm, turn to me your dark and shining eyes, and I will give you cure for all the harm and maledictions in the Bruja's heart. God's own truth and a fierce, fearless heart. I wrote a poem after the book came out. And um, it was a poem to uh, the woman I married. And uh, the logic of the poem doesn't really take me there. And it's a love poem, and it's more a reflective poem about being on the other side of an ocean and thinking someone, it's thinking about someone and the rhyme took me to other times and other places. Same moon. Across the ocean, the same moon shines on different rooms. 
Over two different seas, the same moon glows on separate glooms. Beyond a gulf of time, the same moon beams on lovers' tombs. Inside my distant heart, the same moon refuses to depart. When I uh, was getting a divorce, I lived with my cousin out at the lake, and I walked his old dog. And we had some incidents a couple times, just some aggressive young dogs. And um, so I wrote this, walking an old dog. Out and around in the winter wooded world, I take the short leash of a long-lived dog on trails by a lake under evergreen trees that will outlive us both. He tugs ahead, looks back over a shaggy shoulder, moving stiffly down the trail. He no longer stalks squirrels and vultures or, or ravages adult raccoons with the savage pounce of a youngster. No longer does he run the hunter's trace or guard a flock. Now I watch for him. I have taken to toting a tall, stout stick on our outings. So many brawl dogs loose, I've had to hurl pebbles and harsh shouts to repel. Once he was jumped by a mean young bitch fully his size, running loose, and all I had with me to defend my old friend was his leash in my fist and my booted foot kicking her ribs, and I ended up between them the leash of whip, keen to lash her face and eyes as her mortified owners raced up. Now I carry a shaft, a hardwood rod. I've wrapped in the, the gripping end in leather, installed a knob, stained it, and have hefted it on mountainside scree and crossing boulder fields and rapid streams, knowing I would crack canine bones or even skulls if it came to it for my old guy. Medieval, a man and a dog, an Irish poem in my pocket, a woolen shirt to civilize the morning <coughs> frost, an old dog and me, out to skirmish one more time, sniffing history and wonder in our wandering wake, from tree to bush to rock we're trailing on, as I narrate these words for when he's gone. In the uh, 90s, I was part of a, a uh, listserv group that wrote about writing in our lives. And one of the members of the group uh, became very successful and has written a novel that's been highly reviewed. I didn't look on the shelf to see it's here. But um, he's now the uh, photography editor for the New York Times, a teacher at Bard College, uh, has received Penn Awards, and a lot of national notoriety, and I'm, I'm very proud that he's my friend. And he goes by the name Teju Coles. And uh, he was, uh, uh, he, I knew his other name, of course. And so I want to, I wrote this poem for my friend Teju Cole. It's called The Metamorphoses, and it starts with an epigraph by Derek Walcott. To change your language, you must change your life. Derek Walcott. Tag continents and cities, pivot and sprint, leaping forests and seas. To change your language, you must charge your life. Smell the snow from the glacier, glowing and blowing in the continental breeze. To charge your senses, you must freeze the light. You have a place in our republic guaranteed by custom and birth and law. To change a landscape, you must sketch it right. Tales of Greek and Yoruba <coughs> goddesses, identity as an axiom, an unseen flaw, to change its logic, you must fool its flame. 
Old friend, I knew you before you were cool or even cold, as one wag says in a loving vein. To change your life, you must change your name. And I want to end with two points that are very recent. And uh, uh, I'm going to do something that uh, Robert Bly does. I'm going to be an asshole. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. He does it well. That, that, that was yeah. wrong here. Let me reach you. Uh, but, but there is something that, that Bly will do that I think works uh, well with, with shorter poems. Uh, and that is to read them twice. And so I'm going to close with my last two poems, and I'm, I'm going to read them twice. Field of Stone. The rising and the setting sun throw shadows from a solitary stone standing in its lonely field. An erratic is a rock, alien from its surroundings, transported by ice or water. You were such. From the place of origin, tumbled and scored, it speaks mutely of age when the sun rises and sets. The time of rock is not the time of men who are as grass. Stones are solid and apart, progeny of deep time. You knew the worth of every <coughs> word and phrase, every letter and character up to down and right to left. At the end, there were no friends. So I will plant a stone in a field for you, holding your shade to the rising sun. This is a, an elegy for a former friend of mine. We've been estranged for years. His name was Kunio Ishida. Uh, I met him in grad school a very long time ago. And we were friends for at least a decade. And he was found dead in his condo last week, and nobody ever went to visit him. And um, apparently, he alienated all his friends and lived as a recluse, supporting himself as a translator. But we were once friends. Ishida in Japanese uh, means stone field, field of stone. The rising and the setting sun throw shadows from a solitary stone standing in its lonely field. An erratic is a rock, alien from its surroundings, transported by ice or water. You were such. From the place of origin, tumbled and scored, it speaks mutely of age when the sun rises and sets. The time of rock is not the time of men who are as grass. Stones are solid and apart, progeny of deep time. You knew the worth of every word and phrase, every letter and character, up, and down, up to down and right to left. At the end, there were no friends, so I will plant a stone in a field for you, holding your shade to the rising sun. <coughs> And finally, uh, another, po another recent poem, which I read, uh, excuse me, I wrote after having read uh, a book written by a friend of mine. And I've been thinking about this poem for a while. But after reading Ken Fontenot's Just a Trace of Moon, which is available here in this bookstore, and being informed by Ken's very fine sensibility, I wrote the poem that I had been thinking about for a long time. And it's fairly short. Nostos. You always heard things would seem smaller, and they were. The old classroom, the house, the walk from school to home, the people, some of them, are larger in their failures. The pump jack keeps chugging away. Memory is lifted from a liquid.